Hey, what's up YouTube? Short video today to let you know that I finally updated all the Unreal projects I released on my Patreon to UE 5.3. Time flies. I started my Patreon quite a while ago already and I had some projects that were still using UE 4, so yeah, it was about time I updated them all. It took me almost 3 days because I have quite a few projects and I wanted to make sure that everything is still working as expected and so yep, everything's to be in order. I don't plan to do this often because it's quite time consuming to do and Epic is extremely conservative when it comes to making breaking changes. That means you can likely open any UE4 blueprint based project in UE5 and everything will likely work just fine. So there's no real reason for me to update the project I provide on my Patreon as soon as there's a new UE release. Still I would hate to make you feel like my older projects are abandoned and that I provide no long time support, so there we go, everything is up to date and guaranteed to work with 5.3. Now during that update process, there's one project in particular that proved to be troublesome. Turns out just to be a big oopsie on my end. Remember that Boyd's particle system of mine seems to work just fine, right? Now let's close that Niagara window. Oh, it suddenly behaves quite chaotically. Let's open that Niagara window once more. And it's back to normal. What the hell? The reason for this behavior is extremely stupid and I'm sad to say that it took me almost two days to figure it out. Turns out the movement logic I built at the time was quite flawed and heavily frame rate dependent. And I didn't notice this at the time because I usually work in engine with the frame rate capped at 60 fps to reduce power usage and my electricity bill. And thus I didn't realize that that particle system was so unstable at a higher frame rate. And it turns out when the frame rate is capped at the default value, 125 fps, Opening this Niagara window makes the FPS drop quite drastically, from 125 to 60. And so the system reaches some kind of equilibrium because I initially fine-tuned it with that very same frame rate. Newbie mistake. So naturally I wanted to fix that bug, but looking at that boy's emitter, well, I was never too happy with it to begin with. It's super complicated, bloated with way too many modules and dependencies and whatnot, it's just way too complex to be a good learning resource. And it's one thing to provide you guys with something that works, but if you cannot pick it apart easily and learn from it, well I feel like I failed at what I set out to do with my patron. It's meant to be something educational first and foremost. So, and this wasn't part of my schedule at all, but oh well, I just spent the last 4 or 5 days rebuilding that system from scratch. And I went from this to this. Much better. And it performs slightly better, it's much easier to tweak and to work with, it's also much better documented, so yeah, I feel like this has a way greater educational value now. So feel free to have a look at it if you're interested, files are available as a tier 2 reward on my Patreon. Consider taking a look at some of my older stuff as well, now that everything is up to date. There's a bunch of very cool stuff that went kinda unnoticed. Now, today's video isn't going to be a tutorial or a breakdown of some sort. I've made a lengthy video on that Boyd's meter when it was first released. It's a bit outdated, but most of what I explained back then is still plenty relevant today. So feel free to give that video a look if you want to have more technical details on implementing a Boyd's algorithm using Niagara. Today I'll simply walk you through some of the settings of that updated version I just released and enjoy some of the results it can produce. I just love Boyd's and emergent behaviors. Look at this, so cool. So let's see what this particle system can do and how it can be tweaked to your likings. The particle system is now contained within a blueprint actor to more easily let you tweak some of its settings and visualize its bounds. So you can first tweak its bounds width and height. And the number of cells in height and width, the maximum amount of particles per cell and the amount of particles. Those three settings are specific to Niagara's Neighbor Grid 3D interface, again something I explained in great detail in that boy's video I released a while ago. You can also specify a wall position and a radius, so particles erratically move away if inside that sphere. Could be your character's position or something, right? Finally, you can visualize and tweak the maximum and minimum allowed altitude in world space if you ever choose to use these two constraints in the particle system, more on that in a second. The emitter can now be scaled and rotated and everything should work. Also, if you actually want to tweak the scale of the effect, like minimize or magnify it, you'll likely need to tweak the particle's mesh scale in the emitter, speed settings and a couple of other things. 
And that's pretty much it for the blueprint. Let's take a look at the particle system then. Now hopefully most of the models here make sense. First, particles are spawned in a box based on the grid width and height on a multiplier. On particle spawn I get the distance field data, and that's used in this position constraint module. First it can try to push particles away from penetration and away from obstacles by at least that distance in centimeters. Next, bounds. This simply clamps the particle positions to the grid's bounds, so particles for sure remain within that grid. Without that position constraint, particles are allowed to somewhat go outside the grid, but they turn back and go back in on their own quite rapidly. So I feel like this should be turned on only if you really need to prevent particles from exceeding the grid's bounds by even a centimeter, like if they are in a fish tank or something. Finally, min and max altitude constraints use the min and max altitude specified in the blueprint to clamp the particle's position in Z. On particle update then, this first module sets the Boyd's algorithm's overall weight, so it's initially at full strength. And then that weight is reduced the more individual behaviors need to kick in, like a bounds constraint. A particle might say, hey, I'm close enough to the grid's bounds, I no longer care about what my neighbors do, I'm going to follow my own instinct now. And my own instinct tells me to move back towards the emitter center or whatever else. And that quote-unquote own instinct is computed here. A particle has its own intended movement direction, speed and turn speed. This is what a particle wants to do on its own, before the Boyd's algorithm is layered on top, based on that Boyd's weight, right? So first, again, there's a bounds constraint. When a particle is close enough to the grid's bounds, it orients its movement direction back towards the grid's center point, and that's what allows a particle to go back inside the grid on its own. Next, erratic behavior. Hmm, basically, every now and then a particle may suddenly decide to move towards a new random direction. And that happens periodically, in between 0.25 seconds and 5.25 seconds in this case. Noise. That adds a bit of low frequency noise to the movement direction and makes a particle move randomly but somewhat smoothly still. The constraint, that's to prevent movement to be too vertical. The way the mesh's orientation is computed is unstable if the movement is purely vertical, so that's a safety mechanism of some kind. Plus, I feel like fishes don't usually change depth as fast as they move in 2D space anyway. Maximum and minimum altitude, that prevents a particle from wanting to move towards the positive Z direction if too close to the ceiling, and towards the negative Z direction if too close to the floor. Some kind of self-leveling out mechanism, if you will. Next, speed is quite simple. Every now and then a particle may gain a speed boost. That's to create some kind of erratic behavior. It only really shows on singled out particles though. That behavior is smoothed out in groups of particles, which is kinda cool. So that speed burst may last some time, and that duration drives how fast the curve is sampled, right? And that speed burst happens every now and then. The time interval can be randomized too. The strength can also be varied randomly each time a new speed burst is triggered. Next, on tick, the speed can also be smoothly varied using a curve, just to add some extra randomness, right? Here, that curve is played from beginning to end in 30 seconds. And finally, that's the initial intended movement speed in centimeters per second, before it's modified by these features. Similar thing for the turn speed, that's how fast a particle may change direction, basically. Next, point avoidance. That makes particles move away from that point specified in the blueprint. So that behavior first kicks in based on the specified radius and lasts as long as particles are not distant by at least that extra amount from the trigger point. It's not bulletproof though, that safety distance mechanism is a bit approximative but it's cheap to compute and good enough. Next, during that point avoidance behavior, a particle may gain extra speed and turn speed. Here, that's how much this point avoidance behavior affects the movement direction, speed and turn speed individually. Again, that's the particle's own intended movement, so a particle also likely needs to care less about nearby particles. Thus, the Boyd's algorithm's overall weight can also be reduced to allow particles to do their own thing and actually flee. 
Similar principle for obstacle avoidance that's based on distance fields and offers similar features. Then movement is applied, so here you can tweak the maximum allowed speed, acceleration and deceleration amount, and the turn speed interpolation speed. That helps to smooth out movement a bit. Flow is an offset applied to a particle's position directly. That's to mimic water current, airflow, and things like that. It doesn't affect the movement direction, nor the maximum speed, nor the way particles are oriented. So a particle may swim against the current or gain extra velocity when moving in the same direction as the flow. Very cool effect. For now, it's just based on a noisy vector field, but you could sample a 3D flow map. Flow force can be clamped and it can be faded out near the grid's bounds to prevent particles from being pushed outside the grid. Flow can also be faded out based on the altitude constraint and also based on nearby obstacles. That's to prevent particles from being unpleasantly pushed against obstacles and possibly getting stuck in cavities and whatnot. Next, that position constraint again, same thing. The particle's mesh is then oriented based on the computed movement direction, but you can choose to limit how much a particle can be tilted upward or downward. For instance, fishes don't usually swim straight up or down, they often have swim bladders and other mechanisms to control their vertical movement. So this may allow a particle to move somewhat vertically but not have the mesh be awkwardly oriented. Next, animation. This module controls three things. The strength of that wiggle animation, the speed of that animation, and how much a fish may bend when changing direction. So here, if speed is zero, wiggle amount is zero. And if the current speed is 50% greater than the intended movement speed, wiggle amount is that much. Right? It's a way to remap the current speed versus intended speed to a given range. Then a fish can wiggle some extra amount based on its acceleration, but that can kinda skyrocket, so it most likely needs to be clamped. Finally, that's how much the speed influences the wiggle animation speed and how much the acceleration does. Next, here are distances in centimeters for LODs to kick in, LOD 0, 1, 2, 3. The Boyd's algorithm itself is configured here. A particle may look at nearby particles up to a certain distance and say, hey, let's match my neighbor's movement direction, or hey, I want to move towards the flow center of mass and get closer to my friendly neighbors, or hey, I'm too close to my neighbors, I'm going to swim away now, or hey, I want to match my neighbor's speed and turn speed. Fine-tune those distances and weights, and you can get a very wide range of behaviors. Keep in mind those distances are intrinsically limited by the grid cell size, though. A particle may only see up to one grid cell away from the grid it's currently in, at most. Finally, particles can be smoothly moved away out of penetration with other particles, given a particle radius. And that's it, I believe it's quite an elegant system now and offers quite a few features. I'm quite happy with it, and it can create a wide range of cool looking behaviors. It obviously has a non-negligible cost, especially with such a large amount of particles, this is a complex effect, but it still remains plenty performant and shippable. Files are available as a tier 2 reward on my Patreon. I'll soon do a very beginner friendly tutorial on this awesome neighbor grid 3D interface to explain everything there is to know about it, because it's quite cool. For now, I'll get back to my schedule and my grass shader series. I'm working on part 2 right now. In the meantime, please consider leaving a like if you liked the video and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thanks to my patrons for the amazing support. I'll see you guys soon. Take care of yourself. Bye bye!